Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome back to another Extreme Overclocking video. In today's video we are going to cover FX8350 Extreme Overclocking. I bought this CPU many years ago and it was also the only CPU I bought, the only FX8350. And I was really lucky with this sample because it's extremely good. It's one of the best I've ever seen back then. It was like in the top 15 of the highest ever reached frequencies with CPUs. I'm not sure which rank it is today. Maybe it's still top 20. We will try to reproduce the scores I did like four, five, six years ago. The reason why I want to revisit the CPU is because it has been sitting in a tray for many years. I don't think it degraded. It wouldn't make any kind of sense because I was practically not using the CPU at all. And also back then I was using the Asus Crosshair 5 formula and now I have an Asus 97 Pro Gaming Aura mainboard, which should be better. It has a much better VRM and therefore maybe we can squeeze a little bit more out of the CPU. I also attached a very nice new feature to this, this small PCB. Let's take a closer look at this. Quick look at the setup, 970 Pro Gaming Aura, currently running with an AMD box cooler. We have two dims, Corsair Ventures, Corsair Ventures 2666, very good dims, probably some of the best DDR3 dims that have ever been made, an NVMe drive where Windows 10 is running from, and then we have this small pin header right here. Typically those pin headers are not populated on a stock board, it's just empty solder pads, but I attached three pins to it. And on a cable we have an Elmore EVC2 PCB. The Elmore EVC is using I2C or I2C, depending how you want to call it. I used the connection number one and then clicked find devices. Then it detected the CHL8328 VRM controller. It's also called, I think, the ASP1000C, something like that on the chip directly. Anyway, if we click on the voltage controller on the left, we can access it over I2C and the PM bus. We have all kind of values which we can read out and also manually change for example switching frequency 300 kilohertz currently you can read out some load line calibration values really interesting stuff you can read out right here if you click on the pm bus we get full access and monitoring of for example cpu voltage and also output power which is kind of interesting i'm not sure what windows is doing in the background right here but you can see like idle power it's just a few watt and then in between it cycles back up to like 10 20 watt no idea what Windows is doing right there. Anyway, we can, for example, also access and change CPU voltage, which is the main thing we are going to need, especially on some boards, older boards where you don't have LN2 BIOS and you have like voltage limitations. Sometimes you cannot exceed, for example, 1.55 volt. Here you can see, if I just scroll down, I could theoretically set 2.5 volt. I mean, this would end the CPU pretty much, something I want to avoid. Currently it's set to 1.32. You can just lower it to 1.3, for example, if I want to. You have to set the gamer mode to enabled, VID type override, apply changes. And then, for example, output voltage is currently monitored right here. It's 1.326. If I apply it, it goes down to 1.3 volt. So that's a very, very helpful software and feature. By the way, the EVC2 also allows additional features like SPI BIOS flash. You can theoretically use this to flash BIOS versions which are not meant for your mainboard. I remember back then when we did the, uh, the EPIC overclocking, we also used the EVC2. And at that point, we were flashing an MSI BIOS on an ASUS board, which was only possible with the EVC2. And then it also has additional features where you can change voltages not only with digital controllers like on this one but also on analog stuff similar to Asus Hotwire. I think we can cover that in an additional video if you're interested in that. It's a very very helpful device so if you're interested in this like extreme overclocking stuff maybe go to Elmore's uh, website and check it out. In today's video we are mainly using it to keep track of power consumption and also to be able to change voltages on the fly sometimes if you're really running on the edge and CPU is unstable, I don't know, at 8 gigahertz. Sometimes it looks like it crashed, but it didn't really crash. Sometimes if you manage to increase the voltage slightly, then the system gets back. You can kind of recover it and keep going with the overclock. That's why external overclocking over the software can be really helpful. That's why I'm going to use this device today. I'm not sure if I should hate myself more or the AMD socket. Again, AMD CPU stuck to the cooler and unfortunately when I pulled it out I bent some pins. 
I really hope I can bend them back and rescue the CPU. This would be, this would suck so hard. CPU back in the socket, I hope everything still works. Put on the LN2 container quickly for this test before we're going to insulate the mainboard and prepare it for LN2. Also have a PCI debug card on there, simply going to test if everything still works before we start with the preparation. Looks good. Yeah, everything is fine. All of those older AMD FX CPUs like the 8350 or 9570 or like an FX uh, 4300, all of those can run full pot, means we can go down to just about minus 190 degrees Celsius. Therefore, we will have some ice building up, some condensation. In this area, not really an in this area, not really an issue typically because it's too cold in here. We won't have any kind of condensation. Worst case, we would have some ice on there. Ice is not electrically conductive, therefore usually doesn't cause that many issues. However, in a region of heat sinks where parts are underneath that are generating heat, you can easily get like a transfer layer where you have ice on top and then condensation on the bottom. Same goes for the VRM. That's why we will have to remove the heat sinks, make sure that all the parts underneath will be insulated. Sometimes if you remove heat sinks, which are using thermal pads, it looks like this underneath. It looks like something is wet and that's just silicone oil which comes out from those thermal pads. It's something that's happening very often. It's nothing dangerous. The silicone oil is not conductive, therefore no problem. But we're going to use liquid rubber insulation, which is kind of like paint. Therefore, we will use some acetone to first remove those silicone oil residues. Almost good to go, insulation is dry, most of the components are back in place. The only last things which are missing is thermal paste on the CPU, obviously the CPU cooling device, temperature probe inside the CPU cooler and then a little bit of paper towel around CPU cooler to catch any kind of condensation drops and then we're good to go. Everything is ready to go. You can probably hear it. There is already a tiny amount of liquid nitrogen in the container, but mainly to maintain temperature around 30 degrees Celsius in the container right now. Just running Cinebench R15 Multi to see if everything is stable with our base setting. You can see the CPU is clocked to three gigahertz across all the cores with just about 1.5 volt, which is obviously too much for three gigahertz across all the cores, but we will keep um, all modules at this speed while we will only up probably the second or the third module We will have to figure out which one is the best memory is running at 2000 megahertz CL9 The Elmore EVC software is also running very smoothly. You can see currently we're running about 160 watt in Cinebench R15 and the temperature is if we move to the right about yeah, 78 degrees Celsius on the VRM, which is fine. There's no airflow in it right now and quite a bit of current. Therefore, that should be fine.
Unfortunately, as usual with extreme overclocking, things are not going as smooth. I'm currently sitting at one, minus 130 degrees Celsius and if I hit about minus 160 it shuts down and those specific CPUs should not have this. And I'm trying to figure out what exactly is wrong. Yeah, typical. I think I tried it like 15 times before. Disabling stuff, changing like PCIe frequency, nothing helped. Disable some onboard devices and now it seems to be working. Awesome, great. I thought I could show you how it's not working, but now it's working, even better. And that's how easy we could get to 7 GHz, currently running 1.9 volt on vCore. In Elmo EVC I said 1.85 volt. It's currently loading with about 50 to 70 watt. About 30 amps, 40 amps. VRM temperature cannot go lower than 1 degree Celsius in readout. There we go, 8 gigahertz on the CPU, 8.1 gigahertz actually. There you can also get an idea how much stress it can be for a mainboard to run at those kind of temperatures. That's mainly related to different PCB layers, different copper layers that are running through the board and then you have different thermal expansion rates because it's not always the same amount of copper at every single position and running it at minus 180 degrees Celsius can cause stuff like that. I've been trying it about 10 times already to hit the 8.2 gigahertz mark. Still working on it, but system is still running nice and smoothly, even though there's no insulation. Still really happy with the system. I think I've been running for like two or three hours right now. I mean, there's building, there's some ice building up on the system, but seems to be no problem. Temperature minus 175, at least that's what a temperature probe is reading. It should be colder than that. And out of pure curiosity, I'm just running Cinebench R15 single threaded at 7.5 gigahertz. And I think, or my assumption would be that even at this speed, this CPU should be slower than the current Ryzen at stock. 172 points, that's more than I thought. That's just above a 4770K. Let's see if we can squeeze out a little bit more. During the benchmark you can see the power consumption is just about 100 Watt and considering that we're only running a single core, that really is a lot. Unfortunately, that's already the end of the video because I simply ran out of LN2. I only had 30 liters and I also had to use them for a different CPU. And you will see that video coming up in a few weeks. Stay tuned for that. So much for the 8350 Revisit. Very, very nice CPU. It's still a lot of fun because it's very unique. It's only this specific platform and those CPUs which can achieve those very, very high frequencies. Even, I mean, nowadays Ryzen, there is no chance they end up at like 5.5 gigahertz with LN2, maybe six gigahertz if you do like validation stuff, but not much higher. Recent Intel CPUs can hit just above seven gigahertz with LN2, maybe like 7.5, 7.7 on liquid helium, which is obviously something I cannot use here. But 8350 is still a lot of fun to play around today. And it's also interesting that even if you push the CPU to almost eight gigahertz, on a single core, it cannot get a single core performance of like a Ryzen 3000 CPU. It just shows how much ahead a Ryzen 3000 is back comparing this to the AM3 platform. So much about this video. We will end this video with some close-up shots of this beautiful system. Thanks for joining in and see you next time. Bye.